completely unrelated. Uh, building houses in upstate New York. And it was here while building houses that I discovered Archer and Adelaide. So while building houses, I sketched a boy on a two by four. Uh, those are two by fours, which are basically supports inside walls. And uh, it was, after sketching this boy, he was sort of the first character I had drawn that I really felt a connection to, that I felt I knew him and understood him. So I went on sketching him. Uh, this is the first sketch of that boy, not on a plank of wood. And of course, that boy would later go on to become Archer Helmsley. And at about the same time, I did a sketch of a girl with two knee-high socks. But one of the socks didn't look quite right, so I turned it into a wooden leg. And I suppose to make her especially tragic, decided she was once a ballet prodigy. And that's Adelaide. So I had these two characters, and I really wanted to start writing about them. Uh, I found a job back in New York City, working at a law firm in a cubicle, which is very exciting. And I also ended up renting the top floor bedroom of a single family brownstone in Manhattan. And this house actually belonged to a famous family. Does anybody know which president the teddy bear was named after? I saw you in the back first. You, yep. Exactly. Very good. So this house actually belonged to the Roosevelts. And this house also would later go on to inspire Archer's house. And like Archer's house, this house was filled with all sorts of nooks and crannies and beautiful art that had been collected from all over the world and tapestries from the 1700s. But it was really the gardens in the back that made me think, this is a world I would love to put Archer and Adelaide into. So my bed... Oh. And I realized that this also, this backyard, was, uh, was a place that I had been to before. And if anybody, have you read The Magician's Nephew? All right, one person, great. Well, this is where Diggory met Polly, I think. So my bedroom was on the top floor. That's me. And those doors on the left gave way to a balcony overlooking those gardens. And it was there on this balcony when I would come home from work at nighttime that I began sort of developing Archer and Adelaide's story and the world that they lived in. A lot of these don't really have anything to do with the book as it stands today, but it was just sort of me getting a sense of the characters, as who they are and how they interacted with one another, and sort of what was the world that they were living in. So I did this for about a year and a half, and at the end, after about a year and a half, I had a huge cardboard box full of drawings and little tiny writings. And I wasn't sure what to do with it, but I wanted to turn it into something. Uh, I hadn't, I wasn't, still wasn't thinking about writing a book. I hadn't written three pages, let alone 300. So what I decided to do was to create a newspaper. I called it the Doldrums Press, and I used this to sort of play around with writing and to, uh, and to sort of organize all the different ideas I had for Archer and Adelaide. And as I was working on this newspaper, I began to think about a third character sort of a character who might read this newspaper and see the terrible things that happen to people and what sort of character that would be. And of course, that would be Oliver. And that's the first sketch of Oliver who would later go on to become Oliver Glove of the book. So I had this newspaper. I put it up online and it got the attention of a lot of publishers in the city. And, and I went in to meet with some people. And eventually, I, I also met with a woman who would later become my agent. And sometimes you need that one person to kind of give you a punch in the back to, to do something. And, and who would become my agent, this woman, she told me to go home, to not illustrate other people's work right now, but to go home, take my box, and try to start turning this into a story. And so that's exactly what I did. I left the Brownstone, I left the Roosevelt's house, and I moved out to Brooklyn, and I began writing a book. Uh, like I said, it's the first book I've ever written, and I learned two important things about writing a book while I was working on this. And the first is that if you're gonna write a book, uh, you're gonna need a writing chair. Uh, this is my writing chair. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's very comfortable. And I used it so much that I ended up breaking it. Um, but it was my writing chair, so I couldn't throw it out. So what I did was I went to the kitchen, I found a cutting board, and I bolted that to the bottom to keep it from pinching my bottom. Uh, and that's the writing chair I still use today. Uh, the second thing I learned is that I really like to use notebooks. I'm a little bit old school, but I like to write things out by hand. And the good thing about having a notebook with you, and I have one with me today, is that wherever you go, whenever you have ideas, you can just write them down. And I think when it comes to good books, it's always in the small details about characters or things. And you never know when those small detail ideas will come to you. So always have a notebook and have a writing chair that doesn't split down the middle. So after I, it took me about a year and a half, and then our, our publisher called HarperCollins bought the book, and I worked with an editor. 
Uh, she sort of told me all the things that she thought could be better, could be worse, and we, and we went through all of that. And then it became time to sort out the illustration work. Uh, I had about three boxes of this size, and I sat down with the editor and the art director, and I think I had every scene basically illustrated, but we had to decide which ones were going to go into the book because you can't illustrate every scene. So we narrowed it down to about 21, and I set to work. Uh, this is where I did all the illustrations, and in my apartment in Brooklyn. And the way I like to work is once I have an idea for a scene, I go into my photo library. I have a collection of about 7,000 photos. And I sort of go through here for, and look for just like little interesting tidbits that I can build an illustration off of. Um, and every once in a while, I see one image that I, I like enough that I actually just steal the entire image and, and use it for mine and not just take an aspect out of. Uh, but then, once I have all my little ideas ready, I put them together into an illustration. And it begins as a line illustration here, as you can see. And once I get that tight enough, I go over to my light box. A light box is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a box with lights in it, and it has a glass top. And what that allows me to do is I take my junky sketch, which is on junky paper, and I get a nice piece of paper, and I put them over one another, and then I turn on the lights and I can trace. So I can trace the line drawing onto the good paper. And once I have it there, I begin the rendering, which is to give all the value and texture and light to the image. And once that's finished, I take it, scan it, and put it into the computer, and then I begin coloring. And I have a little video, quick, to show you guys actually how that, how that coloring process works. Technical difficulties. So that's how I color them. And then all I have to do is repeat that step 21 times uh, for all the full color illustrations in the book. And then once those were finished, I started doing the black and white spot illustrations. These kind of go before chapters and then just add little parts throughout the book. Uh, and eventually, once everything was finished, I had a huge pile of work that Harper Collins then turned into a beautiful book, which is right here. And that's the story of the doldrums. So I thought I would read to you guys a tiny bit quick, and then do you have questions? Hopefully you have questions. Got a couple? No questions in green. I'm going to call on you. I hope you have a few. All right. So this is from the very beginning of the book. Uh, the, sort of the first chapter deals with Archer going from one year old to 11 years old. So this is just when he's born. Out of the thousands of children born every single day, at least one of them will turn out to be a dreamer. And on May the 5th, in room 37E of the maternity ward at Rosewood Hospital, that one child was Archer Benjamin Helmsley. Yes, there was simply no mistaking it. The doctors saw it, the nurses saw it, much to her chagrin, his mother saw it. Even a pigeon that wandered into the viewing room station saw it. 
The young Archer B. Helmsley lay quietly in the maternity ward, staring at the ceiling. He didn't know it was a ceiling. He didn't know what anything was. But Archer lay there all the same, gazing up into that great white nothingness, when all at once two heads sprouted from nowhere. Why, hello there, said one of the heads. You must be Archer. Yes, agreed the second head. You truly must be Archer. Whether he must be Archer or not, Archer was Archer. But Archer himself didn't know that yet. Do you know who we are? asked the first head. How could he, said the second. He's only 48 hours old. The first head agreed. In that case, I believe introductions are in order. I'm your Grandpa Helmsley, and this, this is your Grandma Helmsley. Archer didn't respond because Archer couldn't respond. There's really not much you can do when you're only 48 hours old. But the two heads went on and on about this and that, and Archer looked from one to the other, not understanding a single word. Then a third head sprouted from nowhere. Then a third head sprouted from nowhere, and just as quickly, all three disappeared, leaving Archer to stare at the ceiling. Three days later, Archer was released from the Rosewood Hospital and carried to a tall, skinny house on a crooked, narrow street in a quiet neighborhood of a not-so-quiet city. Archer was too little to know that all the houses on Willow Street were tall and skinny and stacked one next to the other like a row of tin soldiers. Archer was also too little to know that his house, number 375, was frequently mistaken for a museum. You see, Archer's house belonged to Archer's grandparents, the renowned explorers and naturalists Ralph and Rachel Helmsley. Some parents may wonder, how do we know we got the right one after bringing their child home from the hospital? If Mr. and Mrs. Helmsley had such thoughts of their own, they were quickly extinguished. From the very beginning, Archer showed all the signs of being a Helmsley. And during his early years, Archer had a fairly perfect life. Fortunately, his fairly perfect life didn't last very long. Why is that fortunate? We all know perfect boys and perfect girls. They live in perfect houses owned by perfect parents. They dress perfectly and walk perfectly and live their lives in the most perfectly perfect way. They're perfectly dull. So it's fortunate this story is about no such child. This is the story of Archer Benjamin Helmsley. That's the doldrums. Thank you. So I think for questions, there's two microphones here. So if you guys want to form a line or one person, someone in green, someone's got to represent your school. Come on. You, got to, you want to get in line for the microphone? Um, what are the characters' personalities? What are the characters' personalities? Well, Archer is sort of an optimist who thinks anything is possible. Adelaide is sort of, uh, well, she's, she's sort of pretending that her past wasn't her past anymore. And Oliver is kind of a nihilist, which means he just thinks everything's going to turn out horribly wrong. So I guess you could say you have the optimist, the realist, and a boy who thinks everything's going to collapse on us. Is that a good answer? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good question. Um, what inspired you to make his grandparents um, adventurers? What inspired me to make his... Well, I think when I had first sketched Archer, I was thinking about this boy who wanted to do things but was stuck on, on these wooden planks inside the house. And so as a boy who was sort of craving adventure, I thought, naturally, uh, somebody in his family needs to have this. And then when I was living at the Roosevelt's, I was thinking about a family that had prestige at something as well. So that sort of made... It all sort of came together for me to do a family of famous explorers. Good question. Thank you. Did you color the, the pictures with the, um, a computer or by hand? I, did I color the pictures by computer or hand? I did it all by computer. So I scan it into the computer, and then it's about maybe 600 layers in a fo program called Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did you call it the doldrums? Why did I call it? Well, does anybody here know what the doldrums means? Nobody? He's pointing to someone. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> uh, well, the doldrums means, uh, well, the doldrums is actually a place on the map. Uh, there, around the equator, five degrees north and south, is a, is a place called the equatorial calms. And when ships would sail in here, ships that needed a sail, 
they would get stuck because the winds were very low there. So sometimes ships would get stuck here for about a month at end. And that's why the doldrums later be, you would use it as, a, as an expression and say, I'm stuck in the doldrums. I'm bored. I'm listless. I can't move. So it sort of worked well for Archer's parents as being explorers. And then it worked well for Archer being stuck in his house. So they're both stuck. One's on an iceberg. One's in a brownstone. That's a very good question. Thank you. What was the story on how you broke your writing chair? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What was the story on how you broke your writing chair? How did you break your writing chair? What's the story behind how you broke I was honestly just sitting in it one day, and I heard this, Koop! and I looked down, and it was split right in half. I suspect because I found it on the streets of New York City, it wasn't very strong to begin with, um, but I liked it, and it was comfortable, so... And I tend to, when I'm writing, I tend to lounge in my chair and put my feet up on my desk, so I think I put pressure on it in wrong places, maybe. Thank you for your question. Where did you get your inspiration? Where did I? Well, it sort of came from all different, uh, different places. I started getting my ideas back in about 2009, and I didn't start writing the book till about 2012, maybe. So the idea for Archer in the family, a lot of it came from living in the Roosevelt's house. Um, I had spent quite a bit of time traveling to France, so that's why Adelaide is French. Um, and then a lot of it you just kind of make up, too, along the way. So, thank you. Do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. It's not on? Come over here. Go ahead. I'll let you cut. If you could, would you add a new main character? If I could, would I add new main characters? Uh, in book two? which is the rough draft has been written, there are three new main children characters. All in total, there's about 40 characters in this book, and it gets a little bigger in book two. Good question. Um, since his mom doesn't like what his grandparents do, does his dad also feel the same way? No, his father's a bit more of a live and let live because... Because of who Archer's grandparents are, and because his father is a lawyer and not like his own parents who were explorers, I think he recognizes that Archer is different from him the same way he was different from them. You know how sometimes certain traits skip a generation? Yeah. I think that's sort of the dynamic between the, at least the male side of the Helmsley clan. Okay. Good question. How do you, how do you write, how do you like draw so good? How do... Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you like it. Um, it just took a lot of time and practice. Uh, you saw, I think, that first drawing I did of the, the squirrel with the tree was about when I was six years old. So I just, I've just i been drawing for 24 years now. So I promise you, if you draw for 24 years, you'll be doing better work than me. There you go. It's not as intense as it looked. <laughs> Who inspired you to be an author? Who inspired me? Uh, well, I guess I would probably have to give that to Ruel Dahl as well, because after reading Matilda, um, I think Dahl was the first author that I read who, who spoke to you as he was writing the book, and this sort of really changed my understanding of what a book could be. So I, I would probably credit Ruel Dahl as, with that. Why, why are there so much animals on the um, cover? Why are there so many animals? Yeah. Because inside Archer's house, uh, it's filled with taxidermied animals. Do you know what a taxidermic animal is? Okay. So they're, they're filling, the, they fill the entire Helmsley house. And because Archer's an only child and he's kind of stuck inside, he talks to all of the animals in the house and they talk back to him. Yeah. Where can you, you talk where, to your dog or cat? Where can you buy the book? I'm sorry? Where can you buy the book? Wherever fine books are sold. Uh, you can get it on, it's on Amazon. You can get it at your local bookstore here. Books and Books, I think, is the big independent in Miami. And maybe Barnes & Noble or Books and Books first. Where did you get your ideas from? I'm sorry? Where did you get your ideas from? Uh, from my idea machine. It's the, no. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I actually I collect them. So sometimes when you're walking down the street, you see a weird guy and he says something really weird or strange. And if you have a notebook, you can write it down really quick. And if he's still saying weird and strange things, you can follow him discreetly and just take notes and make sure he doesn't see you. And if he does see you, just turn around and run. So I think you, you, you get them from all sorts of different experiences that you have in, in everyday life. Why did you make the book about a ex family of explorers? Why did I write a book about a family of explorers? 
Um, that's just sort of what it grew into. Um, I personally love traveling and love seeing new things, and uh, I think that's just when I had created Archer as a character, that's just who I knew him immediately to be, so that's just the way it happens. Good question. How did you start writing the book if you are kind of still legally blind? How did I start writing the book if I'm legally blind? Yes. Well, I started by walking into walls until I found my desk. Uh, no, I think, I, I don't, I, I'm legally blind in one eye, but I'm not sure if it really affects anything that I do. Um, again, I don't know because I only have one working eye. If I close this, you guys, this is very green over here, and that's a little yellow, but I can see very well with my other eye, so I don't think, your writing is mostly up here, so... Does that answer you? you? Don't look satisfied with that. Is that okay? Why doesn't Archer's parents let him see his grandparents? Why do Archer's parents not let him see his grand? Um, that's sort of one of the questions that this book leaves off in. In book two, you start to see a lot more of the answers behind why his parents kind of didn't want Archer involved in this whole world and the society that his grandparents are a part of. You have to read I'm sorry, I can't give you a more satisfying answer. <laughs> Why did Adelaide um, kept their secret? I'm sorry? Why did Adelaide kept their secret? Uh, well, I think, I'm sure everybody here has a secret they would be horribly, they don't want to talk about and they would never tell anybody, right? And so Adelaide didn't want to talk about the fact that she used to be a dancer. Um, but as with most secrets, they usually tend to rear their head at the worst possible moment. And so eventually when Adelaide has to tell what happens, it's right when she, it's really the last thing that Archer and Oliver want to hear from her. Good question. Why did you make the book? Did Why did I make the book? It's a very good question. And I have no idea. I think it's just ever since I was little, I loved creating things and building things. And I just, I wanted to make something. And when I created these characters, I very much wanted to, to build this whole world that I could put them into. So um, I don't know if it's an outpouring of just too much imagination that you, you need to do something with it. But uh, would you like to write a book one day? So why do you want to write a book? Because like, it gives me inspiration and it makes me like, give me like, the writing because like you said about the notebooks you always have something with you to right. write with right so like that's why I like writing books because okay great so we both don't know but we like to write right <laughs> good <laughs> very good good question if you could would you ever make it a movie um, if, uh, into a film it? yeah uh, I would love to see it turned into a film. Uh, there's been a little bit of interest from different places, but uh, right now I'm kind of focused on writing book two and, and whatever comes later on down the road. So I think before it gets turned into a film, I want to have a better sense of, of what it is exactly. But I would love to see it, yes. Um, do you think that if, like in another book, that instead of Archer saving the grandparents, the grandparents would be saving Archer? Um, possibly. Um, I'll think about that. Book two is in rough form, so there's still time to make some changes. Good question. Thank you. How many books are you planning on writing? How many books? Uh, do you work for my publisher? <laughs> uh, right now there's two. I'm on contract for two, but I'm thinking a bit further down the road, so I don't know if it's five or seven. You've got to stick with an odd number because even numbers are not good, but uh, we'll see. It depends. Once I write the, the book, I'll know how far down the road it goes. Good question. Is your book being sold here? Is it being sold here? Yes, yes, yes. it is. What's the name of Dollar Book? Wait. I'm sorry? What's the name of Dollar Book? The other book. The book. second book? I will be, it will also be called The Doldrums, and then there will be a subtitle, which I can't tell you because I'm not quite sure what the subtitle is yet but it'll still be the doldrums. What are you going to change in the second book? Like? I'm, I'm sorry? When are you going to be finished with it? Uh, well, the first draft is written, and I, I've been working on a bunch of illustrations for that now. Uh, I suspect perhaps a year. I'll write as fast as I can, I promise. <laughs> it takes a little while to do them. Good question. Thank you. Which school did you go to in New York? Which, which art school did I go to? I went to a school called Parsons School of Design. 
So it's a big art school in New York City, and they do things like fashion, architecture, interior design, illustration, fine arts, everything. And I did illustration there. Are you interested? Okay. You're going to go to art school, you think? Is... I, like, I like writing. I like writing stories. Okay. Well, stick yes. with it. I'm sure you can do something great. Thank you. Good question. If your eye that was legally blind, yes. how could it see now? It, how can this eye see now? Yeah. Uh, it sees very poorly now. Like, I can't see your face. I see your yellow shirt. Um, I had nerve damage, so the eye slowly got worse and worse. Now it's at a point where it's not going to get any worse, but I do get headaches occasionally, and sometimes when I'm working really late at night, this eye gets a little droopy because it's not working as well as this one. So I look really strange at nighttime, more so than during the day, I mean. Would you say Arthur is just like you? Would I say Archer is just like me? I would say that each of the kids sort of have a different aspect of me. Um, I think I'm in a certain way like Archer, but I could easily be Adelaide and Oliver as well. So, good question. What is the theme? What is the theme? Wow, you really get to the heart of it. Good question. Um, I would say the, the overall theme is sort of... Uh, Becoming who you are, who you want to be, uh, not running away from, from what, you, what you are, and uh, friendship, the importance of friendship, that it doesn't really matter what you do or how you do it, but who you do it with. That's the adventure. Um, did your publisher ever limit you while writing? Did they ever limit me? Yeah. Uh, no, actually. Uh, I've had a great relationship with my editor. I think she really understood the story. Uh, to the extent where it was actually smaller when I submitted it and then we added about 5,000 words to it. So rather than cutting it up into pieces, we, we made it bigger. And um, with all the traveling, how do you get your writing done for the second book? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's kind of been a learning experience for me because it is my second book and I, this is the first time I've really been traveling for anything. But uh, you just find the time when you go home. Uh, I, do this full, I get to do this full time now. So I think for other writers it's a lot more difficult who have to not only write and travel but then have a full time job and kids. So I think it's, it's pretty okay, easy for me. It could always be worse. Good question. Was it sometimes hard to draw with your eye? I think certain things like perspective might be a little strange for me. I don't see things quite right. Uh, if I'm walking towards you, you might want to step a little bit to the left because I might start to veer into you. But uh, no, I think for the most part, I think it's either Manet or Monet, one of the painters who was blind in one eye as well. So, and he did okay. So I, think it's, I, I don't think it was a problem, no. Good question. What's the point of you? What's the point of me? You. Wow. Of, of the book, the point of view. Oh, the point of view. Okay. You threw me into an existential crisis. <laughs> I, it wasn't. It's a very good question. Um, uh, the point of view, it's a third person point of view. So there is sort of a narrator who comes and goes a little bit, and then you go into the head of Archer. But then when the story sort of switches perspective to Adelaide, you also go into Adelaide's head too. So I didn't want it just to be from Archer's point of view. I wanted to be able to get into other people's heads. So you generally do that with third person. All right. Are there any other questions? No? You want to say thank you? What, one more question? Yes? Do you think you would have done better if one of your eyes wasn't blind? Do I think I would have done better? <laughs> I hope so. I tried my best. Good question. Thank you. Uh, all right. If you all will stay seated and say thank you to our author one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. If you'll stay seated for just a minute, we'll dismiss you school by school. All right, we're going to let our author get a head start because there will be some books available to your schools as you walk out that you will be able to take with you.